All right, we'll have a slow start here. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our lunchtime session today on rural tobacco use. Um, I'm Stacy Sigman. I'm um, a professor here in the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health um, and the director of uh, UVM's Center on Rural Addiction. And we're really excited today to have three great presenters with us for the next hour, Drs. Stephen Higgins, Andrea Volanti, and Bethany Rafe. And I think I'm gonna introduce each of our speakers immediately before their respective um, presentations. Um, so we'll do that um, next, but first let me um, just do a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we'd love to get a sense of who all is joining us uh, for this session. And so if you could please consider I'm using the chat box to share your name and organization with the group. Um, and be sure, I think when you do so, to select panelists and attendees when you use the chat feature so that we can all see um, your note to the group. But we'd love to know who's out there. Um, secondly, you'll also notice that this learning lunch session is actually briefer than um, the sessions in the rest of the conference. So it's only an hour and 15 minutes long. So we won't be having, probably uh, won't have enough time for a formal question and answer se uh, session at the end. But what we'd like you to do, if you're comfortable, is if you have questions to enter them into the Q&A um, session, section little box there that you'll see on your screen. And then we'll um, aim to have our presenters respond uh, to your questions in that same box. And if we're not able to get to all of them, we'll uh, try to reach out to uh, our Cora folks by email afterwards. And then lastly, towards the end of the session, um, Nellie or Jenny will uh, be posting a brief poll, which should pop up on your screens. And it's just uh, several items we'd like to get your feedback. And so we'd love for you to complete that poll whenever you see it pop up. Um, all right, so without further delay, um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today's um, Learning Lunch session. Dr. Steve Higgins is the director of our Vermont Center on Behavior and Health here at UVM, and he is the Virginia H. Donaldson Endowed Professor of Translational Science in our departments of psychiatry and psychology. Uh, Steve is going to get our session started by sharing uh, data and insights related to the growing disparities between rural and urban smoking in the US. So Steve, I'm gonna stop sharing here and kick it over to you for you to share your screen. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Stacy. and I'll get my slides up. Um, everybody see those? Okay, very good. Yeah, uh, Stacy, thank you for organizing this um, meeting, this uh, session. And uh, I think the topic is, is really important. So I'm glad to be part of it. So as you see, I'm gonna be talking about tobacco use in rural versus urban settings in, here in the US. Um, and uh, the collaborators I list here are co-authors on a series of papers that, that we wrote on this topic. The research support uh, is listed below. Um, we have a t the UVM T cores, and then we have a what is known as a COBRI uh, center grant as well. And I have nothing to declare, um, and to my knowledge, neither do any of our of my co-authors and collaborators. All right, so. Um, The, the topic of rural health disparities has been a concern in the US since the 1980s. Um, rural communities on average have greater prevalence of risky health behaviors and worse outcomes than our more urban regions with inadequate healthcare access being a notable uh, contributor. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, with regard to tobacco, it's interesting to, sit, to note that at the time of the landmark 1964 Surgeon General's report on smoking and cancer, smoking prevalence was actually lower in rural than urban regions um, for both men and women. And as I'll show you, that's no longer the case. Um, smoking's decreased considerably in rural and urban areas since 1964, but more so in the urban areas such that we now find ourselves with greater preferences of smoking and use of other conventional tobacco products, the biggest one being smokeless tobacco in the rural compared to the urban areas. 
So the overarching aim of my presentation is just to give you a brief overview of the topic um, using a series of epidemiological studies all conducted using U.S. nationally representative samples from U.S. Um, surveys, national surveys. Um, so the studies actually um, were all, I'm going to present four studies, they were all conducted by uh, the TCORS phase one working group on vulnerable populations that I had the privilege uh, to, to lead and it, and it was really a blast. We, we had a lot of fun, got a lot of work done. So the first study was led by Megan Roberts and um, she was with, at that time, the Ohio State TCORS and they really turned the rest of this um, working group onto the issue of rural urban disparities and, and we were really better for them having done so. Um, so this one you can see in the title, we're looking at uh, um, this disparity around uh, tradi traditional emerging tobacco products, uh, 2013 and 14 is the year she examined. And uh, she used uh, wave one data from wave one of the PATH survey um, and a large, you know, a large sample, you see it there. Um, PATH sampling use, uses geographic unit called segments and they, they're based on census blocks. So a segment was classified as urban if it included greater than um, or equal to 2,500 people, and then all other segments are classified as non-urban and as rural in this study. And each, in each of the studies, um, that's how rurality is defined in the negative. It's not a metropolitan, if the area is not metropolitan or micropolitan, then it's other and, and it's rural. Um, and then we're looking at weighted national prevalence for each tobacco product in dual and poly tobacco use categories, and then they were compared on rural urban differences adjusting for potential confounders. And those I list here are just examples. Um, all right, so just cutting right to the data, um, this whole conference is on cigarette smoking. So I, I'm happy that this table allows me to start with that. So if you look at the first column here, it's daily cigarette smoking. Overall, the prevalence at that time was 14.4% in the US but it was 18.3% in the rural uh, segments versus 13.4% in the urban areas. Highly uh, statistically significant, even after you uh, consider the covariates. And then if you just look at smoking prevalence overall, including non-daily and daily cigarette smokers, it's a smaller difference, but it's still um, highly significant between uh, being more prevalent in the rural than urban. And then if you get over to menthol use, it switches a little bit, somewhat more um, prevalent in the urban than the rural. Um, smokeless tobacco, I mentioned that in my opening slide, overwhelmingly rural versus urban. And uh, I'm not gonna show a second slide um, that was in, or a second table that's in this uh, paper, but uh, that, that disparity is for both uh, males and females. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, no differences even across these uh, conventional cigars, pipes, no statistically significant uh, difference in e-cigs. Um, cigarillos, slightly higher in um, urban than rural, but highly significant. Um, and then emerging products, more urban uh, than rural. But the ones that are really devastating public health and contributing all kinds of disparities where rural populations are sicker than uh, urban population is largely about cigarettes. That's why this conference is focused on them and smokeless is, is pretty toxic as well. All right, so now I'm gonna to turn to a subsequent, uh, uh, the next paper in our series that we did. This one was led by Nate Dugan, also from Ohio State. And um, you know the other investigators are from a a, uh, a number of different T cores, including the UVM T cores. So this one is um, going to look at this disparity over time. So we're going to start drilling down in what I hope you find to be an interesting way. Um, so now we, we're using the uh, NISDA National Survey and Drug Use and Health, and that was a convenience uh, decision having to do with um, 
some other studies that we were doing. And so the data from the NISDA was readily available for us to look at this issue using it rather than PATH, no, nothing more than that. Um, it's also a nationally represented survey, US civilian non-institutionalized population, 12 years or, and older uh, measuring prevalence and correlates of drug use. And then um, we're going to be comparing current smoking status defined, as you see there uh, in the parentheses, among adults. And again, the um, definition of rurality is, is in the negative it, if it's not metro or micropolitan. And then um, we're going to do unadjusted and adjusted analyses. And I just want to take a second to read you a list. I didn't get on my slide of the um, adjusted variables because there's a lot and you understand why when, when I turn to the data, we adjusted for age, race, education, income, whether you're unemployed, whether you have an outdoor occupation, whether you're married, whether you have anxiety, depression, uh, health insurance, use or smokeless tobacco and um, have another substance abuse disorder. Okay. So now what we're looking at is, um, smoking prevalence in rural versus urban uh, from 2007 to 2014 with the rural on the top and the urban on the bottom. And you can see there's downward uh, trends in both, but a greater downward trend significantly so in the urban than in the rural. So you're, you have disparities you can see throughout, but they're getting larger over time. And now the next slide is really the uh, biggest contribution of this study. And that is we try and knock out the disparity by controlling for that long list of covariates that I mentioned. And initially you can completely knock it out. There's no disparity that you can't account for with these socio demographic and other uh, characteristics of rural versus urban communities. But by the time you're getting out of here to uh, 2012, 13, 14, you can't knock it out anymore. And it's growing. And that's, that's pretty, pretty darn interesting and I think important. Um, so then we moved on to uh, the same data set and we want to drill down a little bit more. And now we're going to get into sex differences. And um, so now you're looking at that same adjusted table that I just showed you, 2007 to 2014, but now the, the um, participants are sorted into men and women. So if you look at, um, you, you can see the, um, the symbols we're using for each here. And what's going on is if you look at the top, the men, male and female, the men, in ur rural and urban areas aren't differing over time. The difference is in the women. Um, so I, you know, I may have said that a bit too strong, but the, the significantly so, that you're getting the significant effect from the women and not from the men. And so that's, again, a, a really uh, new observation at that time and an important one. So um, we were very interested in um, how this might affect women of reproductive age. We have an interest in that population because of the potential for multi-generational impacts. Um, and so this is the fourth of the studies that I'll show you. And it was led by Tyler Niver from the UVM T cores, but with Megan and Nate and all the other uh, folks still hanging in there and collaborating with us. And so um, we're still using NISDA and we're now gonna focus in on women of reproductive age, um, 18 to 44 years. So we're, we're looking from 2007 out to 2016 in two year uh, increments or two year collapse across two year periods. And so you can see this disparity in that population um, the rural on the top and the urban on the bottom. And you can also see a more pronounced decrease in trend over time in the urban win women um, compared to the rural women. And that's statistically significant. Um, in this next slide, and the, those are adjusted for, for potential confounders. And in this next slide, what we have is on the left panel, we have the rural women on the right panel, we have the urban women, and we now are sorting by pregnancy status. That, that um, prior slide I 
showed you pregnant, non-pregnant women were, in, were grouped together. And so a couple of things. One is whether if you look at um, rural not pregnant to urban not pregnant, you see a difference. And the same thing um, if you look at the pregnant women, rural, rural versus not rural, um, urban. But the other thing that's really, um, I think, an important feature of this study is if you look at the um, estimates for not pregnant and pregnant in the rural population, they're overlapping considerably and not statistically significant except at this one uh, time period. Whereas in the urban, they're, they're different all the way through. And um, that's an indicator that the urban women who find out that they're pregnant are quitting at a higher rate than the, than the rural women. In fact, we have no real um, evidence that's statistically significant of the rural women quitting related to pregnancy, except in this, this one um, data point. So, um, and then I guess the last thing I would say is, um, and this isn't, doesn't really speak to the rural urban disparity, but the trends in the pregnant women um, in both the rural and the non and the urban um, populations are not significantly uh, decreasing over time and the not pregnant are. So we need to do better about women quitting during pregnant, quitting smoking during pregnancy in both urban and rural areas, but it's especially a problem in the rural areas. Okay, to wrap up. Um, the uh, rural urban disparity in cigarette smoking is robust and impactful, contributing to disparities. Um, Andrea Valanti has uh, published on this topic recently. Cancer disparities are very pronounced, also cardiovascular disease, and then also mortality. The disparity is disproportionately impacting women, including those of reproductive age and including pregnant women. And then where previously this, these disparities were readily accounted for, by differences in socioeconomic or demographic disparities, age, income, those you see listed here, and that's not the case anymore. Um, disparities in availability of in, and enforcement of tobacco control and tobacco regulations appear to be important contributors in areas where change can be promoted. They're actionable areas, but there seems to be something more going on as well, like almost a culture that's more supportive of um, tobacco use in the rural than the urban areas. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Steve. That was, that was great. It really set up our session perfectly, um, I think. Um, so let me share my screen. And I'm just going to remind um, everyone, especially though, for those of you that weren't with us in the first few minutes of this session, that this is we're a brief one at this lunchtime hour, just a, an hour and 15 minutes together. So um, on the off chance that we don't end up having time for a formal question and answer session at the end um, of our time together, we're encouraging everyone, if you do have questions, um, for example, for Steve in response to his presentation just now, um, feel free to put them into the Q&A box and then the presenters will aim to respond to them during the session. And then we may also have a couple minutes at the end as well, um, but feel free to use the Q&A um, box. Our next um, presenter is my colleague here and friend, Andrea Valanti. Um, Andrea is a, an associate professor in um, our departments of psychiatry and psychology here at UVM and an epidemiologist whose primary focus is on tobacco use among young adults and other vulnerable populations. Um, and the title of Andrea's presentation for us today is the prevalence of smoking and vaping among rural youth and promising approaches for addressing it. I'll stop share. It's all yours. Take it away, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for having me and thank you all for joining our lunch session today. Um, the other part, the other hat that I wear is as co-director of the Surveillance and Evaluation Corps within the UVM Center on Rural Addiction. So um, my interest in youth and young adult tobacco use has grown um, into really thinking about how we can address um, tobacco and substance use in rural young people. 
So these are my disclosures. I don't have any industry funding or anything to disclose today. So I wanna just start by highlighting the tremendous success that we've had in decreasing past 30 day cigarette use in youth. This is from 1991 to 2019. And in 2019, we were at a, a prevalence of 3.7% uh, of our youth currently smoking cigarettes. Now, the unique thing about a cigarette is that it is a really ideal product. It's very standardized. It's engineered for nicotine delivery, for taste, for satisfaction. It's very easy to use. And what we've seen over the past several years, decade, uh, is that nicotine delivery has really evolved. And so in addition to these really standard products that have been on the market for you know, a century, we are now seeing products like e-cigarettes, nicotine pouches, and others that um, are coming forward. And the way that that's played out is a, a greater uptake of some of those novel products. So you can see this is data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey from 2011 through 2019. And uh, this red line is e-cigarettes. And what we see is that generally the other products are coming down in prevalence, um, but we do see this pretty dramatic increase in e-cigarette use over this period. In 2019, it was at 27.5%. When we look at the data between 2019 and 2020, it's promising we're seeing declines in past 30-day tobacco use in high school students, and we are seeing significant reductions in any tobacco product, any combustible product, multiple tobacco product use, e-cigarette use, cigar use, and smokeless tobacco use in this period. Um, and you can also see that a small prevalence of uh, young people using heated tobacco products, another new product on the, on the scene, um, and pipe tobacco. Importantly, um, what we also are seeing is that this is this is the 2020 data. So we have 20% approximately of young of youth um, using e-cigarettes in the past 30 days. But another important change here is that in these past two years of data, 2019 and 2020, we've seen a flip-flopping uh, between cigars and cigarettes, such that cigars are the second most prevalent product used by youth um, and cigarettes closely following. And just to highlight, um, generally, e-cigarettes are not used alone. So uh, this is 2019 data. These are the, the combinations of products and the prevalence. So when we see this dramatic increase in past the due date e-cigarette use, we just need to keep in context that, that the prevalence of e-cigarette use is high and many of these young people are using multiple of the products that we're assessing. Now, when we look at data for rural versus urban youth, um, we see some different changes happening in the trends. Um, and luckily, this has been an interest of more focus over the past few years. Um, and indeed, most of the studies that I found on rural tobacco use came out in about the past two years. So exciting to see more work happening in this area. Um, what we see is that generally between 2008 and 2010 uh, and 2014 to 2016, there is a decrease in cigarette smoking, um, both in urban and rural populations, but we're seeing greater reductions in the urban youth. When we look at the actual prevalence uh, of smoking in 2014, 2016, compared to 2008, 2010, we see that there is a 54% higher odds of cigarette use in rural youth compared to urban in 2014, 2016. So something is happening here. There are general declines in cigarette use that we're seeing in the population data. But as Steve showed, uh, in adults, we're seeing a similar pattern in youth where that decline is not as steep in the rural youth as the urban youth. This is also consistent with changes that we're seeing in differences between uh, rural and urban youth in youth cigarette use, and particularly as it relates to ever smoking. So this is data from 
1998 to 2018, looking at ever smoking uh, in the red, ever current, ever regular smoking in the blue, and then current regular smoking in the green. And these differences um, are comparing the rural to the urban youth. And so you can see here that from 1998 to 2018, we're seeing increases in the difference between ever smoking in rural compared to urban youth. More rural than urban youth are trying smoking. Um, we see general declines in the difference um, of ever regular and current smoking, though I just wanna highlight that this is not equal. So we're not at zero, where still is a difference in prevalence between um, urban and rural youth over time. And then when we look over um, 2011 to 2016, we, we see that there are specific products that are really uh, higher, have a higher prevalence in rural youth compared to urban youth. That includes um, for middle school and high school, middle school and high school students, um, use of conventional cigarettes, higher odds of um, cigarette use in rural youth, higher odds of smokeless tobacco in, in rural youth. And then for middle schoolers only, we see that there's a higher odds of electronic cigarette use in rural youth than urban youth. And again, if we're looking at um, change over time, this is data from Kansas. Um, they're seeing for e-cigarette use a greater increase in their rural compared to their urban youth. So you can see in 2018, 9.8% of urban youth um, reported current e-cigarette current e use compared to 6.7% of rural. In 2019, that was 11.9% of urban youth compared to 13.4% rural. And so you can see that difference here in the, in the orange box, a 2.1% increase in current e-cigarette use in the urban compared to a 6.7% increase in um, current e-cigarette use in the rural population. So almost a three-fold higher increase in e-cigarette use in rural versus urban youth. And this is only in a one-year period. So why? Why are we seeing this happen? Um, so I have a couple of hypotheses. Um, and I'm interested to hear more from our, from our audience. So one is co-occurring risk factors. Um, we know that lower education, lower income, lower employment, white, non-Hispanic, race, ethnicity, all of these things are risk factors um, that increase the risk of tobacco use independently and then in combination with um, rural residents. So these, these things together may also influence tobacco use norms in rural communities, exposure to peer and parental tobacco use. Um, and this is a paper uh, led by Megan Roberts, who was on the TCOR's vulnerable population subgroup as well, um, looking at shared and unique risk factors for tobacco use among rural versus urban adolescents. And some of this is borne out. So what's unique for rural youth? Um, what's a unique risk, risk factor for ever tobacco use? Um, it's having an adult user in their home, parental use, which we know is an important predictor of youth use having a male fa family member offer them a tobacco product increases the odds of trial by four times, four uh, times higher in, in folks who get offered. Um, and then also things like delay discounting, which is a focus of some of the work at the VCBH and how uh, that influences is a unique risk factor for tobacco use in the rural, but not the urban youth. And then also this idea of a smoker prototype. So how does a young person describe um, a, a smoker and is that prototype favorable? Uh, and that's some, uh, again, that's a, a sort of comes in with the idea of norms and community norms and just exposure to smoking in the community that may uniquely influence rural youth. Another possible influence is geographic isolation, which has been shown um, to be an independent predictor of cigarette or and e-cigarette experimentation and poly tobacco use in youth. 
So this is a study led by Melissa Blank, um, and uh, they assessed isolation score, which is a continuous measure of geographic isolation. And they looked at how that predicted um, tobacco use, and they used a latent class analysis to identify subgroups of youth who were using different tobacco products. So they had their largest group was non-users. Non they had a group of 70 um, young people who experimented with cigarette or e-cigarette. They had a group that were current e-cigarette users, and then they had another group that were, that were current poly tobacco users. And so what they showed here was that general, generally the isolation score was higher in this group that had that were e-cigarette or cigarette experimenters or poly tobacco users. And that, that played out in additional analyses where they controlled for a number of other factors and found that isolation score, a one point increase in the isolation score increased the odds of being a cigarette or e-cigarette experimenter by 30 percent, uh, being a poly user by 51 percent, and then when they were comparing some of these groups to each other, um, again, isolation score as an independent predictor controlling for others um, in terms of experimentation and poly use. So a third potential reason for um, greater tobacco use in rural youth is access to cheaper tobacco products. And um, there's a recent study out in tobacco control, which I'll share, um, that shows that there are higher odds of dollar stores selling tobacco products in rural census tracts versus urban census tracts. We know from um, work on menthol cigarette marketing that there is um, targeted marketing in communities that are more um, socioeconomically disadvantaged of specific products. But this is the first time that I've seen data out on the fact that when you're looking at all these potential um, characteristics of census tracts by race, ethnicity, age, uh, median household income and urban rural classification, that urban rural classification remains significantly associated with having a dollar store that sells tobacco products um, in a specific census tract, even when you control for everything else. Um, the only other thing that is significantly associated with having a dollar store is having uh, a high percentage of school-aged youth. So that sort of combines together higher, um, Census tracts that have more youth and are rural are more likely to have dollar stores that sell tobacco products, large, you know, and generally that's at a reduced price. And then finally, um, is that there, there's potential unequal implementation of tobacco control policies across these uh, rural settings. So there's some recent studies out on Tobacco 21, which is the increasing the minimum age of sale of tobacco products to age 21. Um, that has been implemented federally at this point, but up until, um, you know, up until recently, this was implemented locally or at the state level. And so there's a recent study um, looking at Tobacco 21 policy adoption across the US um, and factors associated with voluntarily implementing Tobacco 21 prior to the national, um, the national implementation. And again, uh, urban environments were more likely than rural environments to voluntarily adopt a Tobacco 21 policy. Um, and so this is, again, uh, an important uh, reminder that these national poli these policies in general, and even national policies, there may be unequal uh, implementation of the policies, even, even if they are um, implemented across the whole population. Sorry, unequal enforcement of the policies, even if they are um, implemented across the country, and again, unequal adoption of potential policies um, in, in rural um, versus urban settings. So where do we go from here? <laughs> what works? Uh, this is uh, the list of interventions to both present, prevent and um, reduce 
tobacco use. Uh, this is the community guide to preventive services. And you can see the list here of everything that's recommended. The top four are recommended to prevent uh, initiation of tobacco product use. And also most of them are related to cessation, um, recommended to improve cessation. And these things include comprehensive tobacco control programs, smoke-free policies, interventions to increase the unit price for tobacco products. We know young people are particularly price sensitive. Um, mass health, mass reach health communication, mass media type of interventions, uh, reducing out-of-pocket costs for cessation treatment, quit line interventions, mobile phone based interventions for cessation, internet based cessation interventions. And the only thing that didn't rise to recommend it is having mass media cessation contests. So if we think specifically about rural um, tobacco prevention, uh, these are the list of interventions that have been identified as effective um, in prevention for rural youth. And this comes from a great report um, that was led by colleagues in Maine on advancing tobacco prevention and control in rural America. Um, so for policy interventions, reducing youth access through Tobacco 21, smoke-free indoor air, taxes and restricting advertising all recommended for reducing use in, in youth and rural youth, um, counter marketing campaigns uh, that target products with a higher prevalence and specifically some of these types of campaigns um, have been focused on smokeless tobacco and that includes Vermont's down and dirty campaign that was run a few years ago. Um, using graphic images of health related of tobacco related health harms. But one note is that we have found that tailoring messages for rural youth um, has, not all, has not necessarily um, affected their impact, that generally youth respond well to existing campaigns that have not been tailored. So that's actually promising. And then in terms of cessation, um, there are policy or systems interventions similarly to prevention, smoke-free indoor air, taxes, improving provider use of cessation best practices, mass, cam mass media campaigns that, are promote, that promote smoking cessation, um, and delivering cessation treatments in both healthcare and non-clinical settings. Um, this can include boosting quitline referrals, providing free NRT, using non-clinician providers, and developing mobile phone-based programs for rem or remote delivery of cessation. So web-based programs for young people, text message programs for young people um, seem to be particularly relevant. And another piece that I wanna call on um, Matt Carpenter's presentation earlier in the conference and work that he's been doing over several years, this idea of nicotine replacement sampling, providing uh, NRT, the way that you get a, at a provider visit, the way that you get a toothbrush from a dentist, um, that has shown real promise um, and a particularly had a, had a strong effect in rural setting, in rural participants. This was not specific to youth or young people. Um, indeed, we don't recommend or uh, NRT hasn't been approved for youth uh, use, but this is something that I think is very promising in terms of improving cessation in rural populations. And we actually have launched a uh, pilot study in the Center on Rural Addiction distributing tobacco toolkits at the point of um, at the point of care for opioid users who are also tobacco users. And so this is something we'll be interested to see how it plays out over the next few years. <coughs> Another thing I wanted to highlight is recent studies that have come out on pharmacotherapy for young people. Um, this is a study that uh, tested varenicline for cessation in, in teens and young adults aged 14 to 21. Um, and generally, they found that there was, at the end of treatment, not a difference between um, the treatment and control group. But the thing I want to highlight here is that when they followed people out um, to, to 18 weeks or 26 weeks after the end of the study, there is a, a, a large difference 
in, um, in abstinence between the varenicline and placebo group with a relative risk of 1.82 uh, favoring the varenicline group. So that is promising evidence on use of varenicline. And then also vaping cessation is really a priority for young people um, as, as noted by Amanda Graham, who I think is on this session as well, uh, who launched a free quit vaping text message program with her team at Truth Initiative. Uh, they saw a dramatic uptake of the uh, vaping cessation. People are voting with their feet. Young people are interested in this in a way that they have not been interested in smoking cessation. So that's very exciting. Um, and then she published a randomized control trial of that vaping text message program, showing that they had um, higher abstinence rates at seven months compared with those in the control group, 39% uh, higher odds of abstinence at seven months. So all, again, very promising in how can we reach uh, especially rural young people. Other things for us to think about. Um, so we have had... Uh, you know, generally we have focused on youth. Um, there is evidence that cigarette initiation is marching into young adulthood, um, that we're seeing greater uptake of ever, ever use and of daily cigarette use in young adulthood. So that's an area that I think we need to focus on moving our prevention efforts um, up. So beyond the, the 18 and under population up through at least 21. And then thinking about how we are seeing differences in adult cigarette smoking over time. Again, we can see as Steve presented this uh, difference between urban and rural populations where there's a bit of a disparity. Um, and we also see uh, a little bit of a difference in cannabis use where rural non-cigarette smokers are the group that is increasing in their cannabis use um, most rapidly. So uh, as we've discussed throughout the conference, the way that these substances work together is something certainly for us to keep our eye on. So we continue to address multiple challenges, uh, multiple tobacco products, co-use of tobacco and other substances. How do we increase the reach and uptake of cessation interventions in young people? And how do we move prevention interventions into young adulthood? Um, this is a study that I run to try to track these things in youth and young adults in Vermont. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Andrea, that was great. Let me pull up slides for our final. Can everybody see that? Hopefully. Um, so that was uh, a really terrific presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, um, if you have any questions for Andrea, um, on the off chance that we don't have time at the end of this session for a, a true robust discussion, please enter them into the Q&A box um, on your screen and she will aim to uh, respond to that during, and then we may still have a few minutes together at the end where we can still have some discussion as well. Um, I would like to now introduce our final um, speaker for today. Dr. Bethany Rafe um, is a professor of psychology at Rowan University in New Jersey. Um, her primary research activities involve developing and testing the integration of technology with behavioral interventions for promoting um, healthy behavior change. And Bethany today is going to be sharing um, some of her work with us to develop an innovative, remotely delivered intervention to reduce vaping among young people. And I think this holds particular promise for efforts to reach ge geographically um, isolated smokers in our rural communities. So I am going to cease the sharing, Bethany, and hand it over to you. Thanks so much. All yeah. right, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> can everybody see my slides we're good yeah maybe put it in presentation mode as well it, it is is it not look like it to doesn't look like that i see a few different panels. swap display then it may work the better use slideshow. it is in slideshow for me okay um let's try this again i'm gonna do this 
and it'll be fine if that if if that's the only way hold on let me yeah try. of course yeah i'm gonna put it in presentation now did that Perfect. work yeah yep. okay thanks. all right <laughs> thanks so much so thanks so much for the um invitation and for um inviting me to uh, participate in this panel. Uh, Andrea's talk was a really great segue actually into my talk. So I'll be talking about an intervention that we were just testing the fe feasibility um, for uh, promoting nicotine keeping abstinence in young adults. So just to start, um, I just wanted to note that I don't have any conflicts of interest uh, to disclose and I wanted to thank my research team for helping carry out this project. So I don't think I have to get too much into the prevalence because I think Andrea did a really great job of, of giving updates on that. But as we know, vaping um, is highly prevalent in young adults and, and youth. And so these, these are just a couple of recent studies, but um, looking at overall lifetime use as well as past 30 day use and comparable in uh, um, rural population as well. And so I also think that at this conference, there's been a lot of discussion about why we should focus on vaping cessation, whether we should focus on, on vaping cessation at all. And I think um, some of the obvious reasons are it, we just don't know what the health effects are for vaping um, because it just hasn't been around long enough for us to, to study. And the, the 2019 sort of um, occurrence of this E Valley where there was the vaping related lung injury made it clear that we really just don't know what the impacts have, what the impact can be of vaping. Um, and so uh, although that, that turned out to be mostly related to uh, cannabis uh, vaping, it's still something to be concerned about. Um, also, there's been a lot of discussion about the potential pathway to combustible cigarette and cannabis use. And then as Andrea noted, people wanna quit. So especially young, young people want to quit vaping um, who have been vaping. So that means we need to be developing tools and strategies for helping them quit. So uh, what I, most of my research has been really um, inspired by a lot of the work that, and has kind of um, carried on a lot of the work that, that Steve Higgins and his group have um, done with contingency management. And, um, you know, at this point we've, we've applied it to cigarette smoking, to combustible cigarette smoking, but we hadn't seen it yet applied to vaping. And so that's what we wanted to try to explore, just the feasibility of, of using contingency management to initiate vaping abstinence in young adults. So typically with smoking, we use carbon, carbon monoxide as our primary outcome measure um, and our method of validating, verifying that people are not smoking. And then financial incentives are typically used as the incentive. Obviously we had to do things a little bit differently for vaping since it's non-combustible. Uh, and there's good reason to believe that this would be effective for vaping, just like it is for other um, health behavior. It's been shown to be incredibly uh, effective with lots of different health behaviors. So there's no reason to believe it wouldn't work with vaping, but there's still the need to, to evaluate that, the feasibility of that approach and how to go about verifying abstinence and, and so forth. So that was really the goal of this study. Um, and because uh, this is really focused on rural um, populations, I wanted to just show this map of New Jersey, uh, which is uh, one of the most highly, most densely populated states in the country, but you'll see that the dense population is really um, in two locations, right around Manhattan and right around Philadelphia. But the rest of the state is actually really um, low density population and a lot of rural areas. And a lot of our students, we're, in, we're located in um, where the circle here represents, which is Gloucester County in Glassboro, New Jersey. Most of our students, um, it was historically a, a commuter college uh, or school where a lot of people were coming from all around in these very um, rural areas. So a lot of our, our students are, are still coming from those areas. So um, the inclusion criteria for this study, again, it was just a pilot feasibility study. We were looking to recruit folks who had been vaping for at least the last 25 of 30 days, um, not using any other nicotine products. So um, they couldn't be using combustible cigarettes, although they, uh, could, they would report to us if they had any history of that. Um, less than 35 years of age, because we were really interested in focusing on this young adult population. They had to express a desire to quit vaping and they had to have access to the internet and video conferencing capabilities like doxy.me, which I'm sure a lot of people know about now that the pandemic um, forced everybody to go online. But we were doing all of these things before. So my work has always really been focused on uh, translating technology into these effective behavioral interventions. So uh, because we didn't have any funding, we, this was just all internally funded. Uh, we really, we wanted to just 
get the feasibility. So we recruited, we started recruitment in February of 2020, um, and that date should be uh, noteworthy. Um, and we were um, really only had the, the supplies and the, and the um, funding to enroll eight participants, but we wanted to see the interest. So we only had our, we had one um, little listserv at, um, email go out once a week. And from that, we had 50 people who completed our screening, um, 22 met our inclusion criteria, which meant that 22 of these um, wanted to quit. They met our age criteria and all of those others that I mentioned. And we enrolled the first eight just because of, our, again, our lack of um, funding. So the eight participants that we had ranged in age from 18 to 22 years. They were predominantly female. We had uh, three males and five female. They were self-reported uh, as white for racial race, and um, two of our participants were uh, Hispanic ethnicity. They had been smoking for on average about three years, uh, starting around 16 or 17 years of age. And uh, they all smoke flavored uh, solution for the electronic cigarettes, which is important um, as we've seen throughout uh, this conference, the flavoring is, is relevant. And actually New Jersey did change their laws about flavoring in um, electronic cigarettes in April of 2020, at the end of the, at the end of April. By that point, all of our participants had completed the study except for one VO8 and he was in already well into the cessation portion as you'll see um, in the study. Uh, we also asked if they vaped anything other than nicotine, although we didn't ask them what specifically um, and 50% of them were smoking other, other things or vaping other things and two had a history of, of combustible cigarette use but that was not current. So as everybody knows, uh, Rowan, and like the rest of the world, uh, shut down all operations in March of 2020. At least we were March 12th. We were kind of on the early end as far as the country goes, because New Jersey, as, as we know, was hit particularly hard with, with uh, COVID early on. So we were able to recruit our first four participants, half of them pre-lockdown. So we had them in person um, doing their first session just to get all the supplies set up. And then it was already intended to be remotely delivered at that point, after that point. So that didn't have to change. The other 50%, the other four participants were recruited fully remotely. And we just, I went and drove and dropped their supplies off at their house. Um, so I know that they were living in rural areas because I know um, I had to go out to where they were living and um, drop off their supplies. And uh, so again, we didn't really have to do much to, we didn't have to make any IRB uh, modifications because this was always intended to be remotely delivered, um, which is obviously a real strength for working with rural um, populations because they don't have to come in frequently and, and travel. So our primary method of verifying vaping abstinence, uh, nicotine abstinence was salivary cotinine. So we had, Nick Alert was sort of the, the method for collecting like easily accessible and low cost method of collecting cotinine. Um, but we had been having a lot of issues with Nick Alert and I think a lot of other people had as well in our previous studies. So we wanted to compare Nick Alert to another method of collecting cotinine, which is a Lear ice cream. And that actually, because of all the problems that we were having with Nick Alert internally, we were testing it and having a hard time having anybody come up uh, as a non-smoker in that method. We um, relied as our primary outcome on a Lear on the ice cream, which is just a binary outcome. It's just a yes, no. Nick Alert is semi-quantitative, which has a lot of advantages as well. Um, so it gives you a range of uh, cotinine levels. So as I mentioned, this was a small study. We only had eight participants, but we did a rigorous single case design um, to be able to, to at least get some idea of whether the, the approach was effective as well. So what we used was a, a rigorous multiple baseline design where our participants, and sometimes these are called cluster randomization as well, where um, our participants were randomly assigned to either a two-day baseline, a four-day baseline, or a six-day baseline. And um, we did our cotinine testing every other day because of the longer half-life of cotinine. So if they were in the two-day baseline, they had one cotinine, submission if they were in the four day they had two and three if they were in the six day uh, baseline and they so they called us using doxy.me which i'll talk about in, in a minute um and if is and they did the the cotinine submission uh over the the video with us live 
And they earned three dollars just for showing up, just for doing that, independent of any abstinence. They didn't have to meet any goals uh, during that baseline period. Then during the treatment, which was a two week treatment, so this was 14 days, which meant again, we were still meeting with them every other day. So that was seven total um, cotinine tests that we collected. They were still getting $3 just for showing up because we wanted to provide some incentive for coming to the meeting, even if they were positive for um, vaping or for nicotine use. And so they could then earn a bonus, uh, an escalating bonus, if they met abstinence goals for uh, based on the, the salivary cotinine test. So $2 to begin, and then it incremented by $5 for each subsequent negative submission all the way up to $32. If they submitted a sample that was positive or they missed a sample, they earned the $3 for that session, but they didn't get the bonus and the bonus was reset back down to $2. So they could get a, a total of $140 during this portion of the treatment intervention. So the video calls were approximately 20 minutes and we started with Nick Alert because it took a lot longer to uh, process Nick Alert than ice cream. So we started with that one and then we had them do the ice cream submission, which took 13 minutes exactly. They swab their mouth for three minutes and then it processes the results for 10 minutes. Uh, during the 10 minutes that we were waiting for the ice cream to, to complete, we talked to them about what struggles they were having with, with abstinence and just sort of a little bit of counseling, um, motivational interviewing, kind of inspired counseling. Um, it was also the middle of like the apocalypse <laughs> at this time. And so we also were there as so, just social support. You know, everything had um, transitioned to online. So all the all their classes were online. They were moving back in with their parents. There were some stressful things happening. So we may have talked about some of those things as well as they came up. Some people didn't uh, want to talk at all. So they just go off and do something for that 10 minutes and then come back at the end. And at the end, they would show us the results, take a photograph of it, write down the date, their name, um, what, what sample it was, and send us the photograph of that. They also mailed us the results back in um, plastic bags, and we very carefully with gloves and masks and everything uh, verified that everything matched. So these are the results from the Allure ice cream, and each participant is shown in as a, their own row um, and uh, organized from shortest to longest baseline. So you can see the dotted line indicates the baseline uh, period. And the darker um, squares here represent uh, positive cotinine results. Uh, I should say not one of the 72 scheduled samples was missed during this time. Uh, we had one invalid result with our very first participant when we were still sort of getting the hang of using the Allure ice cream testing uh, procedure. And that never happened again, because it's really very simple to use. Um, we, and uh, what you can see here is that for all the participants, they were testing positive for nicotine um, during baseline. And pretty shortly after uh, we implemented the treatment, they were abstinent from nicotine vaping or from any nicotine source. So they were negative for nicotine. Uh, some people took a little longer to completely clear nicotine out of their system than others. And what we did for that was because cotinine has such a, a long half-life, if they were abstinent by their third sample, then we retroactively gave them their bonus for the earlier samples in that period. Um, we had one person relapse and that was VO1. And I can talk a little bit about her if there's time. These are just comparing the results of the uh, Nick the ice cream with the Nick Alert. And um, so Nick Alert, we had the same outcomes for the most part in terms of decisions, except for uh, what was really cool about having Nick Alert is especially for VO8, you can see here that you can very clearly see that the nicotine or the, the cotinine levels are going down. And that's because we're able to have that semi-quantitative analysis there. We did also have a lot more invalid tests um, as indicated here by these striped, um, so there's a, a few here that are striped. And we had the, the VO1 missed a couple of samples. She lost her supplies uh, for those last couple of samples. You can also see that there's very few zeros, very few indication of complete non-smoker according to the Nick Alert results, which is why we were having concerns about this method. Because even when we internally tested it with our own staff who are non-smokers, we almost never, I think we only ever got to a level one with Nick Alert. We could never get to a zero. So even the fact that we have these zeros is, is impressive, but um, is why we were concerned about Nick Alert. 
So we also had the participants complete some treatment acceptability, um, just ask them how what they thought about the intervention. They gave it high ratings in terms of it being convenient, effective, and fair. They would recommend it to a friend. Um, they thought the every other day meetings and the 20 minute meetings were just the right amount of time. Um, they could, so it wasn't too long, it wasn't too short, it was just right. However, 40%, not surprisingly, thought that it should have been a longer intervention, more than 14 days, which obviously is what we would like to do. This was just feasibility testing. 75% um, said that if they needed to quit vaping again, they would use this method in the future. And their favorite part of the intervention was surprisingly not the incentives, uh, the supportive staff and every other day calls. So from the participants perspective, you know, we were comparing, we had our own thoughts on the Lear and Nicolert, but we wanted to get the participant view on it. And it, it was pretty consistent with our own perspective. They thought it was easier to use. It was more accurate and they liked using it more um, than the Nicolert, the, the Ilear, uh, Alir versus the Nicolert. Uh, there obviously are these advantages of Nicolert with the semi-quantitative measure, which I thought was great. Maybe during the early stages of abstinence um, when we're looking for reductions and then switch over to Alir later on. So in conclusion, we found that it was both feasible and potentially effective to use contingency management for uh, nicotine vaping abstinence. Uh, the 20 minute telemedicine calls, I, I, we couldn't disentangle that from any of the other parts of the intervention, obviously, although, you know, we had those calls during those baseline periods. So those were there. That's not enough to get people to want to quit. But um, we don't know what would happen if we took those out and tried to make this a completely asynchronous uh, intervention. That would be uh, really good to know because we'd want to be able to roll this out um, and scale it up on a large scale. But at the same time, potentially these 20 minute telemedicine calls could be um, wrapped into a quit line service in the future. So that might be one way to solve that. Uh, it, when thinking about rural, rural populations um, that you know, we're trying to reach, if we're doing any kind of technology or internet based intervention, we have to make sure that they have access to broadband internet. And we know that because the pandemic sort of revealed the continued uh, digital divide that exists with regard to access to, to internet and technology. So that's something that would need to be um, considered. We didn't have any problems with that with our participants, especially because many of them had to move during the course of the study during uh, the lockdown. And so it didn't pose any problems for us. So some future directions. Um, one of our participants via one, the one person who relapsed, also reported using CBD. Um, so she never stopped vaping. Uh, during the study. And so it, it's unclear what role that may have played, uh, either positive or negative, on her relapse. Um, also, the, the using cotinine was great because it, it uh, doesn't distinguish between the nicotine source, which means this could be used to target dual users who are smoking other substances. But we would also like to be able to, you know, if vaping is, is really a concern, then it shouldn't really matter if it's nicotine or other sources that if there's you know, health concerns or cost or anything like that. Um, we'd want to have a way to measure marijuana or, or uh, cannabis use as well, since co-use is so high uh, between those two. Obviously, we want this to be a longer intervention uh, moving forward. And then, as I mentioned before, accessibility to technology can be a concern. So this is uh, uh, published in the Experimental and Clinical Psychopharmacology if you're interested in other details about the study. And uh, that is all I've got. Thank you. Thanks, Bethany. That was wonderful. Let me share screen one last time here. Attempt to. Um, so I saw some great questions coming in for the presenters and um, they've been answering those. So thanks everyone for sending your questions and to the speakers for, um, for responding. I'm trying to quickly calculate whether we have time. And I really feel like also, I bet a bunch of people will be wanting to have a couple minutes before the 115 session for a bio break. Um, but let me first um, also point you to probably a poll that's gonna be popping up on your screen in the next minute or so. And we thank you in advance if you could um, complete that. Um, I also wanted to just put a, a big plug in. Well, first I wanted to thank our speakers um, for your time today. Um, as well as everyone else who maybe ate your lunch around the campfire here with us. Um, and you probably are already all aware, but our final 
um, session in the conference is coming up in just a few minutes. And so this will be paper session five, and we'll be um, seeing a presentation again by Andrea um, uh, on more around the message, messaging on nicotine content in SIGs, um, as well as presentations by Eric Donnie on nicotine reduction and gin tidy. So hopefully everyone can join us for that next session. I also wanted to, whoops, tell you every to tell everyone about um, try to invite you to join us. This is um, a community rounds webinar that we're hosting as part of the um, Center on Rural Addiction at UVM. Um, Dr. Budney from Dartmouth is going to be uh, giving a lecture on Wednesday, November third, on cannabis use in rural populations. So uh, please reach out to us if you'd like uh, to register for that as well. And thank you again um, to each of you for joining us. And I'm going to close this down here. Thanks to everyone. And I hope you enjoy the rest of our conference. Yeah, great, great um, job by everybody. Stacy. great job organizing this and all the speakers. Bethany, I loved your presentation. I've, first, I, I've seen that. Uh, I was taking some notes, good stuff. And, and of course, Andrea <laughs> knocks the ball out of the park um, again. And uh, yeah, it was just terrific. I learned a lot and I really enjoyed being part of it. Same here. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, great organization of good talk, Stacey. That was great. Hopefully we'll all be in person next year at this time. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, everyone, Thanks. so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.